The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. <coughs> Hello and welcome to AWCI's Convention and Intex Expo Reconstructed. Today's presentation is a combination of an education session and solution showcase originally slated for convention. Um, this webinar is one of several that AWCI is bringing to its members uh, through the month of April. Today's presentation is Changing the Landscape of Drug Screening Compliance, What Employers Need to Know. It is sponsored by Micro Distributing. I am Anne-Marie Silvatelli, AWCI's Director of Education, and will be your host for today's presentation. I'm going to, you'll see a poll pop up on your screen, and if we can just have everyone um, take a second to answer that. Um, We'd appreciate that. We just kind of would like to know how many people are viewing today's webinar with you. So please click your selection on your screen and submit. Before we start, a few housekeeping items. All attendees should be on mute during today's presentation. However, we ask that you please mute your phones or computer microphones to ensure that we keep the line clear for our presenters. Should you have a question at any time during today's broadcast, please submit it by using the question box in your GoToMeeting dashboard. Um, <clears throat> we'll have a brief Q&A at the end of our presentation, as well as we will make every attempt to get all your questions answered. Also, in your um, GoToMeeting dashboard, there is a Handouts tab, and if you open that tab, you will see a PDF. Um, for today's presentation, and it has all of our presenters' contact information, so I think you might want to utilize that, please. So thank you to today's sponsor, um, Micro Distributing. I'd like to introduce Justin Lee and Brent Worley. They'll share some information about their company and then introduce our presenter, Bill Judge. So with that, I turn it over. Thank you. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Hi, everybody. This is uh, Justin Lee, along with Brent Worley. And I wanted to uh, <clears throat> wanted to welcome everybody today. Hope everybody's staying safe uh, amongst all this craziness. But um, a little bit about a little bit about our company. Uh, we're with Micro Distributing, and we do drug and alcohol testing, and they are instant tests. Um, we are partnered with uh, Bill Judge, and you know, throughout our slides are brief slides, we will actually uh, show you how we are going to integrate with Bill and uh, uh, Anne-Marie. Next slide, please. Uh, Amber, I'm still, I'm seeing the, the changing landscape of drug and screening compliance right now. There we go. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, we're actually a private, privately held and family owned operated small business. We're based out of uh, Texas. We've been in business for 20 years. We are an HHS, HHS licensed medical device distributor. We're FDA registered specification developer, and we do business in every state and internationally. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Here's Here's a, a little bit about our test. We have offer urine testing. Uh, urine devices uh, can test up to up to 16 drugs at one time, and also the saliva testing, which can test up to 12 drugs at one time. Um, we offer these to uh, for you know pre-employment testing, that sort of thing. Uh, we also do random testing, reasonable suspicion, and uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, next slide, please. Here's a little bit about all the other services that we do offer. Obviously, the stat test um, with the manufacturing, the FDA, CLIA, workplace and insurance exempt. Um, we, we do test for over 30 drugs of abuse and alcohol available through urine, saliva, and also hair devices. Um, we also offer lab testing uh, for confirmations. Uh, we have a nationwide collection site network, certified laboratories, licensed MROs, random selection, and other uh, support services. We offer training for state law compliance, policy review, product training, 
employee and supervisor training, and also our stat web, which will offers, you know, our product online product ordering, online training, and online test ordering and results. Next slide, please. The Statware is our software, um, basically an integrated streamlined paperless platform to manage and view all aspects of your drug and testing program. Um, comprehensive solution, handle every aspect of your drug and testing program in one place. Consolidation from billing, testing protocols, clinics, labs, MRO, instant devices, pricing result reporting, user access and management reports. Um, cost control create profiles according to the services and test packages selected by management. And the biggest part of it uh, and why we're here today is obviously the, com the compliance engine that is built into our software. So basically how that would work is you would order a test or an instant lab, ping integrated compliance database with test data, and then you would receive an alert in your state that if uh, to proceed with the drug test, or if something was wrong, it would, turn up, it would turn up red. And that would mean that you cannot do that instant drug test for whatever reason in your state. And then it will give you a reason why you cannot and also offer other, other resources that we have uh, to move you forward with the drug testing. Um, and that is why we have uh, Bill with us today. Um, he's going to go over uh, compliance with everybody. And we want, to, uh, we want to go ahead and bring him on. So Bill, if you would take over, please. Well, uh, thank you very much, Justin, and uh, Brent is uh, along with us as well from uh, uh, Micro Distributing, and uh, Anna Marie is is really the one we we need to thank for pulling all this together. Um, and uh, I'm sorry I can't be with you folks in person. I I was looking forward to it, uh, but my thanks to AWC for arranging all of this. Um, essentially, what we're going to try and, and do is cover an awful lot of ground here today. Um, I am trying to take advantage of the circumstances that we're all living under, bizarre as they are, uh, to uh, do a little bit of education and catching up on some information that uh, uh, that I've always wanted to to take the time to do, and uh, hopefully you folks will do the same thing. So, uh, what we're going to sub uh, the subject we're going to deal with today uh, is uh is marijuana but i want to first talk about the gorilla that's in the room here and that's the coronavirus issue and how it relates to drug testing um you may not have thought about this before but uh, we've been asked by an awful lot of our customers how to deal with this issue in light of the coronavirus um and there are an awful lot of issues that uh, this this pandemic raises um, you've got ADA issues and OSHA issues and, uh, you know, CDC guidelines that you need to, to deal with. Um, but just very briefly, there's an awful lot of information out there on this now, and I'm going to show you some uh, resources that you can have uh, uh, to check out more uh, reading material if you'd like. But uh, one thing we have to remember, and my biggest concern about this whole issue of the coronavirus and drug testing has to do with the ADA, um, because the ADA prohibits employee, employee disability-related inquiries or medical exams uh, unless, they, unless you can show that they're job-related or consistent with business necessity. Now, those are key uh, words there, job-related and consistent with business necessity. Um, and you're going to have to prove that. Uh, generally, a disability-related inquiry or medical exam of an employee is job-related and consistent with business necessity uh, when an employer has a reasonable belief. Now, that isn't necessarily defined, but a reasonable belief based on objective evidence that the employee's ability to perform the essential functions uh, will be impaired by a medical condition or an employee will pose a direct threat due to the medical condition the employee has. Now, one thing I want you to understand is in a CDC publication, or excuse me, a, an EEOC publication, uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, um, the question was raised, you know, what is a direct threat? And the answer was based, I'm, I'm quoting here, based on guidance of the CDC, the public health authorities 
uh, and public health authorities, as of March 2020, the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic meets the direct threat standard or definition. Okay, so is there a reasonable belief? Well, reasonable belief must be based on objective evidence obtained or reasonably available to an employer prior to making a disability-related inquiry or requiring a medical examination. Uh, and now we know that, uh, according to uh, EEOC, that this pandemic that exists creates, uh, uh, in a sense, the uh, direct threat uh, to our workplaces. So what does that mean in practical terms? Um, well, you, the, the resource that I'm going to show you goes on to ask a lot of different questions, such as, can I require applicants to be tested? Can I check temperatures uh, of my employees or applicants? And so you, you, I want you to check these resources because you'll find a great deal of information and a lot of those questions that are answered. One thing we all have to understand right now is that this is such uh, uncharted territory uh, that a lot of this we're trying to do our best to relate to existing material and existing information and uh, think through how it might might apply so of this and decided by courts by any means uh, this is just too new um, all information about applicants or employees obtained through a disability related inquiry uh, or medical exam must be kept confidential that's one of the areas that i'm most concerned about make sure that you've got policies and procedures established that will uh, uh, maintain this information as confidential. Um, a direct threat uh, and a pandemic. Okay, well, a direct threat is an important ADA concept here. Um, and during the influenza uh, uh, pandemic, uh, the question is whether the pandemic rises to the level of a direct threat. And quite frankly, the CDC has essentially uh, determined that it does. Okay, so that's the guidance that um, is available to you that I'm going to show you here in a moment. Uh, here are resources that you can um, uh, go to. Uh, I urge you to do so. Uh, there is information from both the, uh, from the CDC, from OSHA, uh, from EEOC, uh, and from DOT if that applies to your workplace. So. Um, I would urge you to uh, download this information. Uh, it's available to you uh, through the PDF that you can download right now uh, during this conversation that we're having. And I would urge you to go and check out that information because it's critical to dealing with the pandemic that we are all faced with right now. Okay, now with that out of the way, <laughs> if we can say it's out of the way. Um, let's talk about where we are or where we were before this pause uh, in all of our workplaces, but where we are with marijuana and employment in our workplaces. Um, one thing I want you to understand is that when dealing with the issue of marijuana, issues that you as an employer have to deal with in uh, uh, setting up and running your workplace drug test program. There are many, many other issues that you have to consider, and I'm not gonna go into the detail of all of these things, uh, only because we don't have enough time. I could spend an entire three-hour seminar just on this slide alone, you can understand. Uh, dealing with marijuana issues and work comp issues and ADA issues, uh, OSHA, uh, unemployment, uh, federal rules, NLRB issues, and, and, and key court cases, all of these things, including state compliance laws, all of these things uh, will impact how your drug test program operates um, and decisions that you're going to have to make. What I would urge you to do is make certain that you are aware or have a resource that will help you deal with all of these issues. Okay, um, there's a lot out there. There's a lot of information you've got to try and sort out and uh, see what applies to you. 
Uh, we certainly are available to help you sort through all these issues and help you determine which apply to you and which do not, um, and then help you put your policies and your procedures together accordingly. So um, please make sure you're aware because every state is different, every workplace is different, and how these various issues apply to you uh, are going to differ. There are a couple of things. First of all, I, let me tell you, you cannot have a single corporate policy dealing with drug testing anymore. You just can't do it. There are too many different rules, state by state, federal versus state, union versus non-union. Um, all of these issues have to be dealt with as they relate to your specific workplace. You cannot have a, sing, a, a one corporate policy that applies across the board, across the country. The next thing I'll tell you is, please, please, please stop using DOT policies to drug test non-regulated workers. You can't do it. It doesn't work. If you, you sit back and you think about it, a lot of the definitions alone under DOT rules just don't apply when it comes to testing non-regulated workers. Plus, um, you've got uh, 20 two states now, 22 states, where uh, there are rules that apply to non-regulated employees. Well, you have to follow those, not DOT. Sure, when you're talking about DOT rules, like for instance, a truck driver, uh, the, the rules that apply to that truck driver preempt, preempt all states' laws. So if we're talking about uh, mandatory drug testing rules or marijuana uh, limitations, those are preempt, preempted by uh, uh, federal rules, okay? That, but when it comes to the non-regulated workers in your workplace, uh, they have to be uh, tested according to state and local laws, okay? So even within a single workplace, you may have two, three, even four or five different policies and procedures that relate to the workers. Think of it from this perspective. What rules apply to the drug test? Not to you, but what rules apply to that drug test we're doing? Think of it from that perspective and then work with the rules that apply to that test. I have found in my 35 plus years in doing this that that helps keep uh, straight what rules I have to deal with. So think of it from the perspective of the test being conducted. Okay. We do about 45 million drug tests every year in our workplaces in this country. And only 8 million of them are federally regulated. The rules that apply to all the rest are state and local rules. Right now, the positive rate hit a 14-year high. Uh, positive rates are up nearly 5% between just just between in one year 2017 to 2018 marijuana positives driving a lot of these issues um, just between 2017 and 2018 the general workforce increased up and the federal workforce uh, positive rate was up five percent now these are statistics you find on the Quest uh, uh, Laboratory website, a wonderful resource. Uh, if you're not aware of it, go to the Quest uh, Diagnostic website. It's a great resource for these uh, statistics and that sort of information. Um, as we talk about marijuana issues, we've got to remember first and foremost what the federal position is because there is a conflict between federal law and state law. Marijuana continues to be illegal under federal law. It is a Schedule I drug. What does that mean? Well, there are five different schedules, and they're all based on whether or not uh, the, the particular drug, whether it's marijuana, cocaine, amphetamines, opiates, whatever it happens to be, um, they're scheduled according to whether or not they are addicting and whether or not they have medical purposes or medical uses. Marijuana as a Schedule I drug means there is absolutely no medical purpose 
for that drug and it is highly addictive, okay? So under federal law, marijuana continues to be illegal. But it's interesting, if you start looking at some of the cracks in that federal position on the legality of marijuana, uh, Congress, since about 2014 in the omnibus budget bill, when it's issued its budget, uh, the money to the Department of Justice, which includes the DEA, there's been a provision in their uh, budget, which basically says, okay, DEA, here's your cash, but you can't use any of it to go after or prosecute someone who is in compliance with their state medical medical marijuana law. Kind of an interesting little little uh, tidbit uh, in the in the congressional budget. Um, of course, the Department of Transportation. If you've got DOT um, uh, regulated uh, workers like uh, commercial drivers. Um, the DOT has taken the position that since marijuana remains a Schedule I drug, uh, it will not excuse being a medical marijuana patient or uh, having used marijuana in uh, one of the 11 states where it's legal. That won't excuse a positive drug test done for federal DOT purposes, okay? Federal contractors, basically the same thing. Uh, federal contract. So keep that in mind. Federal law, federal drug tests that are done are governed by federal rules, which means marijuana is illegal, not an excuse for a positive drug test. Okay. There are uh, statements from the DOT, which you can access uh, right on the DOT's website. You can see here on uh, the middle and the right-hand side are copies of them. Uh, go to the DOT website and you can download uh, the statements from DOT regarding the personal use of marijuana or the medical use of marijuana. And essentially what they say is that's not going to excuse you. Sorry. Um, cannabis diet. Um, this is a, a, a hot issue around the country. Um, CBD, uh, it's, it's a complicated issue right now. Uh, because of the fact that the 2008 uh, Farm Bill uh, essentially complicated things by removing hemp uh, from the definition of marijuana. Hemp is no longer governed by the Controlled Substances Act, meaning hemp now is legal. It's permissible. And all hemp-related products. Well, CBD or cannabidiol is one of the uh, compounds which comes from the cannabis plant. So is marijuana. But marijuana is uh, highly addictive, uh, according to the federal position. Uh, and it, 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 marijuana, or tetra, uh, delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinoid, THC, is the active ingredient in marijuana which creates the high. CBD is another compound from the cannabis plant, of which there are well over 400 different compounds, by the way. Um, and CBD does not create a high. Uh, you will not show positive on a drug test because by law, uh, under the Farm Bill, in your state, uh, regardless of what uh, people tell you, uh, regardless of what it, the guy selling it at the local gas station tells you, CBD is not legal if it contains more than three-tenths of a percent of THC. That's how you distinguish THC from CBD, uh, in addition to the fact that one gets you high and one doesn't. Uh, CBD will not get you high. It will not show positive on a on a, on a drug test. So that's the distinction. And there's a lot of confusion out there about CBD, mainly because it's being sold everywhere. Um, so bottom line, CBD will not cause a positive. It will not get you high, okay? So if somebody tells you that they tested positive for marijuana because they used CBD on their sore elbow, well, they're wrong. Um, unfortunately, they purchased it from an illegal source or a source that is not in compliance with state or federal law. Um, uh, the next burning question is, uh, can marijuana drug testing, is there any way uh, to, to test for marijuana and determine that someone's impaired? The answer, no. 
today, currently, we have no test methodology, no test means of determining when someone is impaired from the use of marijuana. Okay? All right, CBD, we've already covered this. Um, it won't get you high, won't test positive, provided you got it from a legitimate source. Is marijuana testing going to create or, or reveal impairment? Absolutely not. Um, one of the things to keep in mind with marijuana, and it's kind of interesting to just take a quick look, and I, I just wanted to show you. When you smoke marijuana, here's how, here's how it works. Now, keep in mind, uh, this is a, this is a lawyer's way of describing for you how this stuff works. I'm not a scientist. I don't play one on TV. But if you smoke marijuana, it breaks down into your system as THC, delta nine tetrahydrocannabinoid. Okay, that along with uh, then the hydro hydroxy THC, which THC breaks down to very shortly after you use it. Um, THC and hydroxy THC are impairing substances. They create a high. That breaks down further, however, into carboxy THC, which is not impairing. It doesn't make you high, okay? So you smoke dope. First, it breaks down into THC. Then it breaks down into hydroxy THC. And then it breaks down further in your body to carboxy THC. Now, the THC and hydroxy THC, as you can see from that chart there, uh, only lasts in your system for six to 12 hours, and then it's gone. Those two substances are no longer in your body. Uh, the impairing substance aren't, substances aren't there. The carboxy THC, that's what sticks around for a while, uh, depending on how much you use and how big you are and what you eat and all the, all the many variables that go into this determination. It can last in your body for a few days or, quite frankly, for a number of weeks. Uh, well, think about it. Which one of these do you think we test for, the THC, hydroxy THC, or carboxy THC? Well, we, we only test for carboxy THC. Why? Because it's there. We can find it, okay? But it's not an impairing substance. The Arizona Supreme Court a couple of years ago threw out a DUI conviction because the court said, wait a second, the state statute for DUI says you can only convict somebody if they're found to have an impairing substance and you only found carboxy THC. It's not impairing. Okay, will that present problems in our workplaces? I don't know yet, but it's a pretty darn good argument. And if I can think of it, so can a bunch of other lawyers. Just keep it in mind. Um, the drug testing and the drug test times, this is important too, I think, so that you understand how this can, can work. Um, if you look at the marijuana line there, it's about the fourth, fifth line down. Um, yeah, I'm comparing saliva to urine and, and to hair, just so you can see detection time. So in other words, how long after I smoke dope, uh, and my son, by the way, says I'm the only human that continues to call it dope. How long after I smoke the substance can it be found in my system? Or how soon after I smoke it can it be found in my system? Well, look at this. Look at this chart. Um, for saliva, if you look just at the marijuana, when does it appear in my system? Within five to 10 minutes. Okay, how long after I use it can I still find it in my system? Well, six to 24 hours. Okay, so saliva has a short window of detection compared to urine, which has a thir three to 30 day detection period. Okay, but if you think about it, if somebody uh, smoked dope in, in the parking lot and came into work, uh, look at the urine. For, for marijuana. It's not in your system and, and detectable uh, for two to three hours. Is that, are you going to find it if you smell it on somebody? Eh, maybe, maybe not. But if you look at saliva, it's in their system almost right away, within five to 10 minutes. Okay. The hair, not going to spend time on it right now because we don't have time. So I'm going to move on. You can see and compare that chart when you have time. All right. Let's look at the states and where we are. Right now, 
right today, and it could change soon, there are 33 states plus Washington, D.C. that authorize the medical, medical use of marijuana, and 11 states uh, in Washington, D.C. that authorize the personal use of marijuana, provided you're over 21, okay? Cannabidiol, there are 18 states that specifically authorize the use of marijuana, typically only for medical reasons, okay? So keep that in mind. If somebody says, I used CBD, that caused a positive. If they're in a state like Iowa, they better be able to show that they have a doctor's recommendation uh, for using it. Um, so when you compare where we are with medical use, personal use, and CBD, this is what the country's map looks like today. There are only two states, Idaho and Nebraska, that have no laws permitting medical, personal, or CBD use. Now, that's likely to change quite soon because I know both in Idaho and Nebraska, there are initiatives or legislation pending, okay? Let's look at some of the specifics in terms of limiting what you as employers can and cannot do. Here's where you wanna pay attention. Um, these 14 states laws specifically say that employers need not, need not accommodate the use of an employee being under the influence of marijuana at work. What did I say about being able to determine if somebody's under the influence? Can you find that? Can you determine that from a drug test? No. The language of some states like Illinois, Ohio, Pennsylvania are very employer friendly. We'll talk about Illinois in a second, but um, there are also states though like Massachusetts, Nevada, New York that have some very detailed restrictions you really, really need to know if you're operating in those states, like in Massachusetts, for instance. Uh, the state Supreme Judicial Court is, is what it's called. Uh, ruled a couple of years ago that uh, uh, even though a, a med medical marijuana patient has no authority to sue an employer under the marijuana law, it does have authority to proceed uh, under the state's disability discrimination law. So in other words, uh, you can't sue for protection under marijuana laws, but you can sue for the underlying condition uh, for which the medical recommendation for marijuana use was made. Okay, so disability, state disability discrimination laws are going to become increasingly important here uh, as we proceed uh, with court uh, decisions and this evolves. In Nevada, the state statute specifically says that you do not need to accommodate uh, an employee's use of marijuana uh, but you do need to take steps to determine if you can accommodate the underlying medical condition, okay? So you have to enter into the, the interactive discussion to see if you can accommodate the person's underlying medical condition, not the use of marijuana, but the condition. New York, New York's got restrictions in New York City. Uh, you can no longer test for marijuana uh, for pre-employment purposes unless you're in one of the specified safety-sensitive positions, okay? Uh, by the way, Nevada's the same way. Uh, for pre-employment purposes, you can no longer test in Nevada for marijuana unless uh, the employee is applying for a safety-sensitive position. The good thing about Nevada is unlike New York City, where the, the, the positions are specified as to what you uh, can and can't test, Nevada kind of leaves it up to the employer and it basically says that if the employer determines it's a safety sensitive position, uh, then you can go ahead and test, okay? Um, in these, uh, the laws of these 11 states provide that an employer may not discriminate against an in individual who's a medical marijuana patient simply because of their status as a medical marijuana patient. So if somebody comes to you in Rhode Island and applies for a job and during the process of ap applying for the job, they tell you that they're a medical marijuana patient, uh, you cannot refuse to hire them simply because they told you that. And that's what a court decision said a couple of years ago. Uh, in these 12 states, an employer is specifically authorized to take action if an employee is found to be using or under the influence of marijuana. But 
uh, in, in these five states, a positive drug test alone uh, will not show a, uh, a person is under the influence. Okay, so if you're operating in any one of those five states, just because there's a positive drug test, the statute specifically says uh, that will not show uh, that a person's under the influence. Okay, recent court cases, I'm gonna kind of move through this rather quickly and summarize for you. Um, it, up till about May of 2016, whenever there was a conflict or a court decision, where an employee was fired and they alleged that they had protection under state uh, me mer medical marijuana laws, uh, usually the employer, uh, beginning in uh, 2016, however, uh, things started to change. And uh, courts uh, started to determine that employees did have protections and could not be summarily fired simply because they were medical marijuana patients. And uh, uh, it was either under state medical marijuana laws or it was under state disability discrimination laws. Uh, the other interesting thing is that a lot of times, like in the Connecticut uh, court decision um, a year or two ago, uh, the employer raised the fact that they were protected under, um, excuse me, they were protected because they were following federal law. So because the fact that marijuana was illegal under federal law, uh, that meant that they could go ahead and enforce their policies. Uh, the court in Connecticut and in Delaware and a couple of other of these uh, states said, no, uh, uh, the, the federal law will not preempt our state marijuana law. So uh, you have to look at the specific language of the statutes involved in your state. And you have to make certain that you understand what the state courts are saying as well, okay? Uh, I wish we had time to go more in more depth uh, with these cases. We, we unfortunately do not. I'm happy to talk to you if you're one of these states or one of these states apply to you uh, and not only provide you with copies of the court cases, but to help you to uh, understand what they're saying, okay? Um, here are some of the hot issues. Uh, of course, we already mentioned the uh, New York City ordinance where pre-employment testing uh, for marijuana is no longer allowed unless a safety sensitive job is being applied for. Same thing in Nevada. Um, and uh, um, Illinois, of course, became the 11th state uh, uh, permitting the personal use. New Jersey also has some limitations uh, related to the medical marijuana law in its state that you need to pay particular attention to. Uh, I've also highlighted the fact that I believe state human rights laws are going to become far more uh, important in these decisions related to medical marijuana use, not, not related to personal use, but related to medical marijuana use. I think more and more employees are going to argue that they have protections not necessarily under the state's medical marijuana laws, but under the state's disability discrimination laws. Um, we don't have time to get into all these court decisions. Um, I wish I had time. I want to make certain we've got enough time for questions uh, at the end. Um, uh, I wanted to show you this. This is uh, at least one uh, website's prediction on what's going to happen in the future. Uh, uh, something we get beyond this uh, coronavirus issue. Uh, these are states that uh, have laws pending and uh, uh, likely to uh, pass either medical marijuana laws or you can see in the dark purple color uh, the adult use uh, or personal use of marijuana. Uh, these bills pending. Uh, how they how these states' laws differ? I, I, I picked a, a number of states. Uh, Missouri, Illinois, and Oklahoma, just to show you how important it is to take a close look at your state's statutes. They all differ. And those differences uh, are going to be interpreted by the courts. And so you have to make certain that you look at what the state statute says. So for instance, here in, in Missouri, and these are just examples. I could have pulled up uh, all of the states that have uh, uh, the marijuana statutes, and we have them all. If you need a copy of the state statute in your state, uh, don't hesitate to ask, we have it. 
Um, but in Missouri, um, employers, uh, when they're, if you're concerned about um, how me the medical marijuana law, uh, the new mar marijuana law affects you, uh, understand that in Section 7, uh, it says that nothing in the section permits a person to operate a vehicle, uh, navigate, uh, uh, or be an actual physical control of any dangerous motor vehicle, aircraft, motorboat, et, et cetera, under the influence of marijuana. Or uh, it, nothing in this, the, the law allows someone to bring a claim against an employer, former employer, or prospective employer for wrongful discharge, discrimination, or in any similar cause of action or remedy based on the employer, former employer, or prospective employer prohibiting the employee, <laughs> it gets a little long here, former employee or prospective employee from being under the influence of marijuana at work or disciplining an employee or former employee uh, up to and including termination from employment for working or attempting to work while under the influence of marijuana. And what do we know now? You can't tell that somebody's under the influence simply because of a positive test. Nothing in this section shall be construed as mandating health insurance coverage of medical marijuana or qualifying patient use. So you don't have to necessarily, the statute at least says, you don't have to reimburse somebody, uh, for instance, for workers' comp purposes. Um, Oklahoma. Um, Oklahoma, by the way, remember, has a very detailed mandatory drug testing statute. So if you're not aware of that, uh, please let us know. We'll be happy to provide it to you. Um, Oklahoma courts have been very, very hard on employers who, who do not follow the state statute. So here you now have a medical marijuana law in Oklahoma. And what I've provided for you here. Uh, for Oklahoma and Illinois, it's on the left-hand side is the actual language of the statute. On the right-hand side, I've pulled out from that language some of the key points. So in Oklahoma, uh, there, you cannot discriminate based on an individual's status as a medical marijuana patient. Uh, you cannot discriminate solely based on a positive drug test unless the medical marijuana patient um, uh, is not in possession of a valid medical marijuana license, um, or if they pr uh, possessed, consumed, or were under the influence of marijuana at work, uh, or if they're in a safety-sensitive position, and it's defined further in the statute under uh, Section K. And here's Section K, again, on the left, the actual language. On the right, pulled it out for you. Safety sensitive means any job the employer reasonably believes could affect the safety and health of the employee or others, including but not limited to, so these are just examples, um, handling uh, hazardous material, operating motor vehicle or equipment or machinery, repairing, uh, et cetera, equipment, machinery, and so on, firefighters, operation maintenance or oversight of infrastructure. Uh, dealing with volatile combustible chemicals, dispensing pharmaceuticals, carrying firearms, uh, or direct patient care or child care. Now, remember, those are simply examples, okay? Um, in Illinois, this is where I'm sitting right now, outside Chicago. Illinois uh, has both a medical marijuana law and a, a personal use law. So, both of them are very, very similar. Um, and again, on the left-hand side is the actual language, right-hand side is the language pulled out for you. Uh, under the personal use law, okay, this is the, it's legal to use if you're over 21 law, um, you, employers can have a zero tolerance or drug-free workplace policy. Nothing in the law requires an employer to allow an employee to be under the influence or use marijuana in the workplace. Nothing in this law shall limit or permit or prevent in, uh, discipline or termination of an employee for violating the employer's policy. Okay, so let's pay attention to what we've got for in those first three bullets. You can have a zero tolerance policy. Um, you, you can prohibit an employee from being under the influence or using, and you can discipline up to and including termination anybody who violates your policy, 
okay? Under the next bullet, what is interesting here is that the legislature in Illinois went on further to define what under the influence means. Employers may consider an employee to be impaired or under the influence if the employer has a good faith belief, which of course they didn't bother to define, that the employee manifests articulable signs and symptoms that lessen their performance, impact their speech, behavior, agility, or dexterity, result in carelessness in operating equipment or disregard for safety, and involve uh, any accidents or injuries. Okay, now, if you do determine that somebody is under the influence, you got to give them an opportunity to contest uh, the basis of that determination, okay? So, here we are. We have zero tolerance permitted. We have uh, 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 discipline permitted. We have a definition of under the influence. And it goes even further and says, employers, you're going to be protected from lawsuits. It says no cause of action uh, can be brought against an employer for drug testing, for disciplining somebody, uh, including terminating them based on good faith belief that the employee possessed uh, or used on duty. Uh, you can discipline based on good faith belief the employee was impaired or under the influence. Um, uh, result, or if there was a, an injury, for instance, to somebody else outside the workplace, a third person, um, and somebody tried to sue you, they're going to have to show that you knew ahead of time uh, that your employee was impaired. Pretty hard to do, okay? So, uh, by the way, uh, before we move on any further, uh, let's understand where we are right now. Illinois permits you to have a zero tolerance policy, permits you to drug test, permits you to fire people, and it protects you from lawsuits, okay? So why are employers in Illinois concerned? Well, because the legislature, at the same time that they created the adult use of marijuana law, amended another law, the Right to Privacy in the Workplace Act, which basically says um, employers can't discriminate against employees for off-premises use of lawful products. Well, when that law was, in, was created, it was never thought that marijuana would be legal. Well, here we are, uh, it is legal right now. Um, and marijuana is considered a lawful product uh, under Illinois law. But what you have to understand is, is that that statute uh, goes quite a, a bit further and essentially uh, allows for, um, and I, I think I've lost control. Um, uh, it, I, I, I lose control, quite frankly, all the time. Um, uh, what we have to understand is, is that uh, this law goes on to say that uh, it doesn't apply, the law or the limitation, this non-discrimination provision doesn't apply if the lawful product impairs an employee's ability to perform. Okay, what you have to do in Illinois, if you have operations in Illinois, you're an employer in Illinois, is you're gonna to have to start distinguishing between safety sensitive and non-safety sensitive employees. Because the law applicable to those two different groups is different, okay? And what you can do differs, so be careful. Um, the medical marijuana law in Illinois, I'm not gonna go into too much detail for you other than to indicate uh, that you cannot discriminate against uh, uh, a medical marijuana patient because of their status. Um, and uh, it also has a very similar language to the uh, personal use law. Employers can go ahead for tolerance policy, can discipline, can test, and can um, uh, take action, take uh, discipline somebody because of of their violation of that policy. And it similarly uh, defines impairment in, uh, in the same way. Okay, so um, what I wanna do now is move on to another issue because everybody keeps talking about the fact that in some of these states with marijuana, the smartest thing to do is to only test when there's reasonable suspicion. Well, I disagree, but if that's where you feel you are, uh, then what we have to do is make certain that we understand what reasonable suspicion is. Now, I'm not gonna show you a bunch of Bolivians jumping up and down on coca leaves, 
What I want to do is discuss uh, what what uh, uh, reasonable suspicion is from the perspective of the laws that apply, like in Illinois, uh, which the, the, the legislature defined for you what uh, impairment or under the influence is, which would be the basis for your uh, test of reasonable suspicion. Um, but uh, DOT also defines what reasonable suspicion is, of course. But I want to move ahead and talk about what reasonable suspicion is from a legal perspective, what you can do. Because I have found in my 35 years of uh, doing this, uh, involved in drug testing, that most managers don't understand the concept of reasonable suspicion. They don't get what it is. They, they're afraid that they can't test somebody unless they have uh, a pretty good, that the, the person is intoxicated, is drunk. Well, that's not what it is. That's not what reasonable suspicion is. And what we have to understand to begin with is that the Supreme Court of the United States in its first drug testing case back in 1989 uh, said that a drug test is a search. Okay, that being the case, we have to define what makes a search reasonable because to meet Fourth Amendment criteria, a search must be reasonable. And the court essentially said in 1968, uh, that in order to uh, have a reasonable suspicion-based drug test, uh, you must have evidence, you must have proof that provides you something more than a hunch. Well, what is that? You got to have something more than a hunch. That's what reasonable suspicion is. Okay. Uh, Seventh Circuit essentially says the same thing. Reasonable suspicion amounts to something less than probable cause, but more than a hunch. Okay. So you're starting to see how we're putting some framework around this. It's, it's not, uh, uh, it's something less than probable cause, but something more than a hunch. Okay, proof. That's what we're looking for. Something more than a hunch that what? Uh, well, that the employee might have violated the company's policy, uh, or basically that the, the employee may have used drugs. Uh, okay, uh, a hunch means nothing, no facts. It's a feeling or a guess based on intuition rather than facts. Okay, so no facts, that a hunch is a fact. Well, the Supreme Court says you gotta have something more than a hunch. All right, something more than a hunch. Proof, proof of what? Violating the company policy. Well, there's a lot of different levels of proof in our legal system. And I wanna compare what something more than a hunch means compared to the other levels of proof in our legal system. The ultimate burden of proof in our legal system is what's called proof beyond reasonable doubt. If I've got facts that show that you committed a murder, you're going to jail if I can prove it beyond reasonable doubt. Well, the other end of the spectrum means a hunch, which is no proof at all, no facts, okay? So going down from proof beyond reasonable doubt, the ultimate burden, the next level down is what's called clear and convincing evidence. That's the standard typically used in contract disputes. I sell you my house, and a month later you find termites in that house, you can sue me, but you've got to show with fact that I knew those little buggers were there. It's got to be clear and convincing. Doesn't have to be proof beyond reasonable doubt, just clear and convincing. Going down from that, we're, we're trying to get down to a hunch there. The next level is a preponderance of the evidence. This is the standard typically used in arbitrations, unemployment hearings, workers' comp, that sort of thing. And essentially what it means is that one side's got more proof or more credibility than the other. That's all it is. It's like consider, okay, you got 51%, you win. Going down from that is probable cause. That's the standard typically used by police officers to search your home. They have to have some fact or facts that demonstrate what? That you committed the crime? No, no, no. That, it, committed the crime means proof beyond reasonable doubt. That happens later. At that stage, we only have some fact or facts that show that you're the likely suspect, okay, which allows us to search your home. Going down from that, it's reasonable suspicion, and over here's a hunch. Okay, as a former high school and college football coach, what I see here is a football field. If I kick off to you from the left going to the right and kick off to you and you get the ball in the hunt, right? What do you got to have in order to 
uh, test somebody based on reasonable suspicion? What do you have to have in football terms? Okay, think about it for a second. In order to test somebody based on reasonable suspicion in football terms, all you've got to do is get out of the end zone. You just got to prevent a safety. That's reasonable suspicion. You don't have to be all the way down the field. Okay, that's reasonable suspicion drug testing. And that's what all of your management folks need to understand. And now with that, I see our time is really running out. I want to turn it back to uh, uh, Anna Marie so we can get some questions in. I apologize for running late. I've got a whole bunch of more information that I'd like to share with you, but you'll see it uh, when you download the slides. Oh, and Bill, we do have um, enough time. We were going to go with what you had for your, um, if we were going to be at convention. So, I mean, you can easily do, um, you know, about 20 minutes. Oh, is that right? Okay, I thought we were, Yeah, absolutely. I, okay, so I thought we only had an hour. God, you never want to give a lawyer more time. Uh, <laughs> but, and one, uh, one note I, to the attendees, if anyone needs to... Um, hop off. We are recording the webinar and we will make sure that you get the handouts um, if you weren't able to download them. So just be um, one to mention that. So back to you. Okay, thank you. And also I would make a note that uh, uh, my contact information as well as Justin and Brent's uh, is, is available at the end of the uh, slides. So please, if you've got questions or concerns, uh, don't hesitate to call. I'd be more than happy to chat with you. I'd love to chat with you, actually. Um, so don't hesitate to give me a call. Um, even though I'm not going to show you slides of uh, Bolivians jumping up and down on Conkalis, there's a few things that I wanted to show you that, uh, in conjunction with the whole concept of reasonable suspicion, uh, I think you might find quite interesting. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to run through a few slides here, um, and we're going to talk about uh, the primary drugs uh, and alcohol. Um, and of course, all the statistics exist here and, uh, you know, all, all the numbers you can possibly find. We've got more statistics in baseball. Uh, but about 70% of people age 18 or older have reported that they drank alcohol in the past year. 57, 56% report that they drank in the past month and 26% report that they engaged in binge drinking. There's a definition for binge drinking, by the way, I'm going to show you in a moment. Um, uh, the, the, the key thing on this slide is to see the number, an estimated 88,000 people die from alcohol-related causes every single year. 88,000 88, people die every year. Um, so it, 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 compare that to other drugs. I think you'll find it fascinating. If you've never seen it before, this is the federal government's chart on what they consider uh, uh, and have done studies on to show when you drink and how big you are, whether you're a man or a woman, here's the likelihood likelihood of essentially being under the influence. Okay. Now, of course, with alcohol, we do have a presumptive under the influence level of 0.08. Uh, years ago, it used to be 0.15, and then it dropped to 0.10. Now it's 0.08. Uh, but just you can see right on the chart here for yourself, uh, if you fall into the various categories in terms of the number of drinks you've had, uh, what your weight is, whether you're a man or a woman, um, whether or not uh, you may or may not be considered under the influence, okay? Sometimes this, uh, this chart really opens people's eyes. Okay, binge drinking. I told you I would show you this. For women, it's considered binge drinking if you have four or more drinks in any one occasion. Think about that. For men, it's five or more drinks in any one occasion. Now, this is how the federal government looks at things. Heavy drinking for women, eight or more drinks per week. You're considered a heavy drinker. For men, 15 or more drinks per week, you're considerate, uh, considered a heavy drinker. And of course, you should never drink while you're pregnant or if you're under 21. Uh, now, I, I did not represent that gentleman on the left there, but <laughs> we want you to make sure you're aware of some of the, uh, I, I've represented some people who are a lot like that gentleman. Um, some of the, uh, some of the uh, uh, health issues, 
that I'm sure most, if not all of us are familiar with in terms of dealing with alcohol issues. Um, and uh, we don't need to belabor what they are. What I wanted to show you, however, for each of the drugs I'm going to talk about are these special slides. Uh, these slides were uh, prepared by the Amen Clinic. Uh, Dr. Amen in uh, Southern California, brilliant, brilliant man, um, has done some uh, sp uh, special uh, uh, MRI type things. They're, they're called SPECT uh, images. Uh, it's a special image of your brain. Now, on the hand side, you can see that's an image of what the brain should look like. On the left is an image of what the brain looks like from long-term alcohol abuse. Now, what appears to look like holes, those aren't holes. Those are portions of the brain that aren't functioning, okay? That, that aren't, you know, shooting the electric, uh, and I, I'm terrible, I apologize, I'm an attorney, uh, <laughs> that aren't functioning by shooting the electric uh, uh, communications, so to speak, across the, br the brain, um, that part of the brain isn't functioning. So think about that. Um, this is a 48-year-old with 22 years of daily alcohol use. And there's also some brain injury in there as well. But that's what his brain looked like. Okay? Now, we do have, obviously, a uh, hangover impact. The DOT uh, rules uh, provide, in case you're not aware, that uh, reasonable suspicion can be based on hangover symptoms. Doesn't have to be limited to just smell of alcohol and so forth. So uh, it can be based on hangover. Now, this is marijuana. Um, we know the impact of marijuana. We know what it's like. Uh, we know what it looks like, some of the paraphernalia. Um, but I wanted to show you that this is a 38-year-old with 17 years of heavy weekend use of marijuana, okay? In the middle, you have the normal brain. On the left-hand side is the look of that brain top-down. Again, what appears to be holes are portions of the brain just not functioning. On the underside, that's the underside view on the far right-hand side. Okay. Now, let me explain to you. Uh, there have been studies done to determine uh, the, the long-term impact um, of, of uh, motor dexterity, uh, cognitive, cognitive capabilities. Uh, there was one particular study. It's called the Yasevich study. I'd be happy to send it to you. They essentially took 10 commercial uh, airline rated pilots. Uh, and it, into the University of uh, California in San Francisco, and they put them in an, in a simulator, had them uh, essentially get a baseline in terms of landing an airplane on a runway, and uh, they all, you know, they all hit the center line. They all did well. They all landed the airplane. Then they gave them a government grade marijuana cigarette, which I'm sure had far less uh, delta nine tetrahydrocannabinoid in it than you could buy on the street. Anyway, so they had them smoke a marijuana cigarette. Then they took them home. They brought them back 24 hours later, and they had them attempt to land the airplane in the simulator. They all missed their mark. One person missed the runway altogether. They all felt fine. None of them felt impaired. How do you explain this? Well, <laughs> it can be explained by the fact that the chemical has impact on the brain. And you can see how it affects the brain just by looking at this particular person's brain uh, from their heavy weekend use. Okay? Up in the upper left-hand corner is a 28-year-old with 10 years of mostly weekend use of marijuana. Um, these are the spec images on the far right, upper right of a 25-year-old daily marijuana smoker, okay? You can see how it, how it works. Okay, now, what I wanna make sure you see is how uh, cocaine also impacts the brain. Uh, again, on the right-hand side is a normal-looking brain. On the left-hand side is what a brain from the use of cocaine looks like. 
opioids. Oh, but let me let me back up for a second, if I can. Uh, well, I guess I can. Um, I'm far more concerned, ladies and gentlemen, of uh, about opioid impacts on the brain, or excuse me, opioid impacts in your in your world um, than I am. Thank you, Anamarie. Appreciate that. Um, we we talk we talk a lot about marijuana these days. Obviously, uh, in addition to the coronavirus, um, marijuana is a big issue in our workplaces. How to deal with it? Um, one thing I haven't mentioned that I should mention is you all need to make sure you dust off all your job descriptions and bring them up to date. They need to make sure they distinguish between safety sensitive and non safety sensitive workers. Job descriptions are critical to winning your cases in court. That, but dealing with marijuana is one issue. The real problem, I believe, in your workplaces, if it isn't now, it's going to be, is opioids. Um, and the numbers are just astonishing. Uh, all of these things, opium, heroin, morphine, they, oxycodone, hydrocodone, these are all uh, available uh, to a certain extent, uh, not heroin, obviously. But the oxycodone, hydrocodone, these are all available by prescription. Methadone, uh, you may be surprised to learn that methadone is not simply a drug used for weaning uh, addicts off of heroin. It's also used for pain. Um, there was a, a famous case up in the uh, state of Washington where a uh, gentleman applying for a job as a uh, terminal in, uh, uh, manager uh, tested positive for methadone. Uh, the company didn't hire him, basically saying, hey, we don't hire people like you, you know, go clean yourself up and come on back here. They actually said that, by the way. Um, when it turned out that the man wasn't addicted to, to illicit drugs, was not addicted to uh, heroin, uh, he was prescribed by a legitimate doctor the use of methadone for rotator cuff injury. Methadone can be used for other medical purposes. So keep that in mind as, as we go through these issues. Um, we have probably a, a little bit more. The, this, this slide's a little bit dated, but uh, when this slide was put together, the CDC was reporting 115 uh, Americans die every day from opioid overdoses, including prescription as well as illicit opioid use. 115 Americans per day dying. So uh, keep that in mind when you, you look at all these numbers from the uh, the coronavirus and how we're all up in arms about it and you know the country is shutting itself down. Well, how, <laughs> look at the numbers from uh, alcohol deaths and from opioid overdoses. You know, come on. Um, anyway, um, where do uh, uh, people searching for pain relief get their drugs? Well, here's a chart that shows you uh, where it comes from. Uh, mostly, uh, it comes from friends and relatives, not necessarily all from doctors. We, we, we tend to jump on the doctors from over-prescribing, and yes, there's a problem there. 22% uh, of the drugs come from uh, doctors, but most of the drugs come from friends and, you know, family's medicine cabinet. So um, there was one study that was done um recently i think it was issued in 2018 um and they, they studied midwest construction companies and uh during the period in which they studied this 2015 they found that there were nearly a thousand construction workers across the midwest those states you see there on the left who died as a result of opioid overdoses and by the way they died on the job okay and uh, uh so it, it, look at those states if you're operating in those states uh, this is a this is a real problem. Look at Ohio for for goodness sake. Um, and here are the costs associated with this. Um, it cost these employers over 5.2 billion dollars. Uh, look at the cost in Ohio was two billion dollars uh, from opioid overdoses. All right, heroin users. Uh, this is what a heroin user's brain looks like. It isn't functioning very well, is it? Okay. This is a normal brain, and on the right-hand side, a seven-year methadone user, uh, sometime heroin user, okay? Normal brain on the uh, left, a 25-year frequent heroin user on the right. That is not a brain that's functioning very well. 
amphetamines. Uh, these are highly prescribed medications. You probably have workers in your workplace uh, that are using these drugs, um, and they are prescri prescribed as stimulants. Um, a lot of times just for attention deficit disorder, but also uh, for other medical conditions as well. Um, PCP, this is not a drug that's normally uh, seen, except in some limited areas like Washington, D.C., quite frankly, um, of the country, uh, but we test for it. Uh, it, is, it was originally a, a, a large animal tranquilizer. They don't even use it for them anymore because it just wigged them out too much. Um, this is uh, what fencyclidine can look like. Okay. Again, all of this information is available on the slides for you. I wanted to get to this, fentanyl. Fentanyl is probably one of the most dangerous drugs out there today. One of the things you have to understand is that typically from street dealers, fentanyl is mixed in with a lot of other substances um, and it'll kill you. <laughs> fentanyl is one of the most dangerous drugs in the country. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid that is 80 to 100 times stronger than morphine, okay? It's pharmaceutical fentanyl. Was de it was developed for pain management treatment for cancer patients. Um, and others, but it is an incredibly dangerous drug. Um, that photograph you see there uh, on the left-hand side, that is a deadly dose of heroin in that bottle. A deadly dose of fentanyl is on the right. It's all it takes. So uh, my goodness, if you've got uh, teenagers, uh, young, young adults, uh, please, please warn them to stay away from some of this stuff. It'll kill you. Okay, so what's your role? Uh, we always have people call us saying, somebody please tell me what to do. Well, what you need to do is make certain that you've got uh, 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 all of your programs up to date and in place. So uh, you need to clearly understand the language contained in your state-specific drug and alcohol screening laws, and I would add medical marijuana laws as well, and what the court and agency decisions are that apply. Uh, for instance, I mean, a lot of times we run into people who are upset because they went to all the trouble of putting drug testing in place and they fired somebody who tests positive and then that person goes down and they, uh, and they get uh, unemployment. Uh, well, why did they get unemployment? Well, we did a survey of uh, uh, decisions in one state and found that 67% of the employers lost unemployment challenges because they didn't follow state's law. You have to follow the rules, okay? You need to make certain that you uh, create and implement, implement and routinely review, update your drug test policies. Make sure they reflect current state's laws, okay? Design and implement sound processes and procedures. This is critical. Putting together a, a good ref, uh, state law reflective written policy is one thing, but I got to tell you, the big item is the procedures making sure that you know what you're supposed to do. Um, some states require that you post notice of the policy. Some states require two different types of uh, uh, notices be uh, handed to each employee. Uh, some states limit post-accident testing. Uh, some states limit or prohibit random testing. Uh, you have to be sure you understand what state's rules are, okay? Be sure to document uh, every comprehensive, the, the job descriptions. Now, it, it's not enough that you have a job description that says, you know, this position is a safety sensitive position. You have to say why. Why is it safety sensitive? Provide bullet points or details as to why it is. You have to be, be prepared these days and it's becoming increasingly important to make certain that you uh, comply with your state uh, disability discrimination laws or the ADA if it applies to prescribed medications. And that means in particular to be prepared to engage in an interactive process with an employee who is claiming disability protection. You have to determine if you can reasonably accommodate that individual's 
underlying medical condition. Educate your employees about the dangers and the impacts of drugs and alcohol. Encourage your employees to seek help if they have an issue uh, with drugs or alcohol. Make certain, make certain, please, 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 to train your managers and supervisors not only about your policy, but about their procedures that they have to follow. Who, who do they contact if they've got an issue? This is often overlooked. Where do they send people uh, if they have, have an issue? And, and, and you don't let people who you reasonably have reasonable suspicion of uh, drive their own car to the clinic. Somebody's got to be prepared to take them or put them into an Uber or however you're going to do it. You have to make sure you go through a procedure and think through how it is you're going to have these things uh, performed. Um, so all of your folks have to be trained. And that, with that, uh, uh, that's my contact information. Um, I, I'm sure Justin and Brent, you're going to provide your contact info as well. Um, but I'm going to open it up to questions. It's uh, 15 past the hour, uh, approximately. And so I'm going to throw it back to you, Anna Marie. Okay, thank you, Bill. Um, great. Thank you for sharing such a wealth of information. Um, we do have some questions. So the first one, how is the legalization of marijuana affecting the workplace? Um, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that, um, but I we do have employers who call who want to talk about uh, dropping marijuana as, as a tested uh, item. We certainly don't believe that they should be doing that. Um, testing isn't the question. Uh, the question is, are you discriminating against someone who tests positive? Uh, so we certainly encourage employers to continue testing. Um, we are finding that uh, the, the positive rates, the use rates are going up. Um, the Quest Laboratory information is certainly reflective of that. Uh, BOT's numbers are reflective of that. So how is, how is legalization affecting the workplace? People are using more. Um, and so you have to be prepared in your workplace for how you're going to deal with that issue. Thank you. Uh, second question is, how accurate is saliva versus a urine test? I might let Justin and Brent tackle that one. <laughs> well, it's, uh, that's a great question. Um, actually, it's, it's not a... Um, it's not how accurate they are. They're both very, very accurate. The, the biggest difference would be the detection time. And I think, you know, Bill in his chart uh, a little earlier in the presentation went over that, um, you know, the, the saliva being anywhere, you know, especially only with the marijuana. Um, the marijuana with the, like what Bill said earlier, with your urine is, um, you know, up to 30 days. Um, and then with the saliva, it's going to be you know, detected anywhere from uh, you know six to six to twenty-four hours. <clears throat> so that is the that is the biggest difference between the two. All the other drugs are pretty comparable, um, but the detection time is more you know as far as accuracy, uh, it's more on the detection side. Um, but they they are both extremely accurate as far as the instant drug testing you know goes. And thank you for that clarification. Um, we did not have any um, other questions come in, um, but on behalf of AWCI, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for today's AWCI's Convention and Intex Expo Reconstructed. Um, we would also like to thank um, Micro Distributing for their support of today's webinar. So um, thank you, Brent and Justin, and thank you, Bill, for um, you know sharing this content with us. And I'm sure everyone will take those um, handouts back to their um, team members and, and get that distributed. And we'll also make sure that um, we get that on our website for folks. Um, so as a reminder, this program was recorded and you'll receive a link to Great. the online program library as well as a link to a brief post-event survey following the conclusion of our broadcast. In addition, we also have some great resources available 
um, through the foundation at our website as well as um, our bookstore and our technical um, pages on our website so please be sure to look at those and then be on the lookout for emails with details of upcoming AWCI's convention and Intex Expo reconstructed events happening over the next several weeks and again thank you everyone again. and have a productive day and stay safe out there thank you thank you thank you